New York lost about 10% of its population between 1970 and 1980. It lost about half a million jobs between the late 60s and the mid-1970s. The jobs that were disappearing were predominantly industrial jobs, and the new jobs appearing in the service sector generated less income and less revenue than the older ones had. The financial sector um, goes through a downturn in the late 1960s as well. And this is at the moment when the entire national economy begins to be plagued by recession. But in New York, the recession of the early 1970s is kind of hits a, a, a city that's already kind of in the midst of the gears of economic change. I would underscore these are not themselves natural or neutral developments. The loss of people to the suburbs reflects the national priorities that focus on suburban home ownership and on the federal investment in infrastructure that made that possible. Most famously in New York, the federal investment that built the Cross Bronx Expressway. The flight of jobs was also possible or facilitated in part because of tariff laws, um, such as the kind of renovation of the tariff schedule passed in the early 60s, which made it possible for garments or clothes sold in the, to be sold in the American market um, that were produced in other countries tariff free. By 1980, there were only 140,000 garment jobs in New York, down from 340,000 in 1950. So in other words, New York, like many other American cities, suffered under a set of policies that were tilted towards the suburbs and facilitated urban disinvestment. Real estate elites in New York also sought to maximize the income on developments, which at times meant pushing to rezone neighborhoods to make them residential and commercial instead of industrial. Um, which is one of the things happening in downtown, actually, and, and kind of a, around the um, decline of the, the seaport and the active harbor. As the city grew poorer, there is a rising need for social services overall, and a shrinking tax base is called upon to pay for things that could have been supported by a larger one. This points to another problem that the city was confronting in the 1970s, which is in some ways the consequences of, of federalism. All cities are dependent on the taxing powers of higher levels of government um, because cities will, are not able to tax incomes the way that states or certainly the federal government can. But by the end of the 1960s, New York was kind of bore an unusually high proportion of some of the costs of its social programs. Many of the new programs of the War on Poverty era were split or structured so that they were split between 50-50 between the states and the federal government. Um, so that's that Medicaid and the aid to families with dependent children, the, the funding split is 50-50. Now in New York State, localities bear 50% of the cost of the programs after that. This is much higher than in almost any other state. And so New York is carrying about 25% of the bill for Medicaid, a burden that Chicago, say, or Los Angeles did not have to tolerate. Um, the city is also you know, doing much, it, it's also paying for more of CUNY at that point than it does today when the split between the city and the state has shifted. It paid for its court system. And at the same time, as we know, New York is always dependent on, for, for, for any new taxes, on Albany. So throughout the late 1960s, city leaders were going to Albany to request the power to impose new taxes. These are sometimes granted. Um, the city does raise taxes in the early 1960s, but not as much as city leaders tend to request. So I think another large question that the fiscal crisis points to is whether entire metropolitan regions might be considered in making fiscal determinations. Why should people who generate their wealth in urban areas essentially be able to sequester their taxes and especially their property taxes from those city governments? Um, another question that this, the growing imbalance between revenues and expenses in New York points to is whether the costs of social services should be borne as much as possible by uh, kind of higher levels of government with greater power to tax incomes rather than weighing on the city. Now, these kinds of questions about the suburbs and the city, the city and the federal government, are not by and large raised as the city runs into increasingly serious fiscal difficulties. And here we get to the kind of most proximate cause of the crisis and the third reason that it happened when it did, the changes in the municipal bond market in the 1970s. So as the city starts to have trouble making ends meet, what it does is begin to borrow money. 
New York takes on a remarkable amount of short-term debt in the late 60s and early 1970s, using vehicles such as tax anticipation notes, bond anticipation notes, revenue anticipation notes, which essentially borrow money backed by expected revenues, um, but ones that may never arrive, or things that are not, these are not general obligation bonds that are voted on by the citizenry, um, they are moral obligation notes. And the city was essentially betting that it would be able to raise this money through future taxes to be collected um, without actually, uh, you know, the, the, the revenues didn't always appear. It also began to reroute funds, capital funds, or kind of funds from its capital budget, so long-term debt, to cover operating costs. So probably one of the most famous examples is textbooks. The city's school system was buying textbooks using capital funds, which is kind of a generous interpretation of, um, you might you say, human capital or something like that. But it isn't really, that, that's not the kind of long-term expense that the capital bu budget is really intended to cover. So the city began to engage in a kind of covert, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't exactly covert, but it was never really publicly and fully acknowledged as policy. Um, a kind of program of borrowing in the hopes that at some point something would change. And it should be said that for a long while, the city's banks were happy to finance the city. Um, the, the, the kind of consortium of clearinghouse banks and the uh, bond rating agencies were happy to give New York's debt strong ratings and to continue to underwrite it and sell it to a national market of investors. But this changes in the early 1970s. And I think it does so for several reasons. The first is actually that the cultural, intellectual, and political context um, of the 1960s, in which there is a much higher embrace of Keynesian economics and a deeper level of kind of support for debt and deficit spending in general, that really shifts in the early 1970s. Um, again, related to the larger economic problems the country is running into, as well as the growing kind of power of the conservative movement and critiques of Keynesian economics. Second, the tax advantages that banks had gained from financing New York were declining as their overseas investments expanded. So the, the tax, um, the, 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 the kind of the, the attractive aspect of tax exempt debt or of municipal public debt on which you do not have to pay taxes on interest, um, that becomes less compelling as cities, as banks kind of have larger overseas investments and are um, kind of not, not kind of deducting or, or adjusting their tax bills in keeping with that. Um, following the Tax Reform Act of 1969, for example, the tax-exempt bond sales shift prior to that, 95% of tax-exempt bonds were being bought by commercial banks in 1970. This drops sharply by 1974. At the same time, New York and other, other cities across the country are expanding their borrowing. Um, New York is not the only city that's kind of going, expanding its, its um, is kind of having these problems, generating the revenues it previously had been accustomed to. And so there's a kind of glut of municipal and state borrowing at this point. And finally, the high inflation of the 1970s makes investors far more wary about holding bonds in general. So the market that had existed earlier begins to dry up. Out of all of this, in the spring of 1975, after a kind of um, protracted, the, the, there are, are many kind of agonizing meetings. Um, there's a lot of, of, of dramatic back and forth between the city's leaders and people in the financial community. In the spring of 1975, the banks that have previously financed the city's debt and marketed their bonds to the rest of the country refuse to do so any longer and say there is no longer a market for New York City's debt. They do not really talk about these different issues facing the industry. They say that the heart of the problem here is that New York is too much of a bleeding heart city and that people don't want to finance or pay for it any longer um, and that the city is, is heading into collapse. Um, but I think that's, you know, it's against this backdrop of larger changes. So they stop being willing to finance the city's debt and when they do so, it becomes, New York at that point uh, is on the edge of bankruptcy. And that's where it stays for the rest of the year. Now, how did the city respond to the crisis? What do its leaders do? Um, 
Well, the first effort of the city is to get help from Washington. And Mayor Beam, repeatedly throughout the crisis period, points out that the city sends much more in income tax revenues to Washington than it gets back. Is there some way, he says, that New York can change the balance of what it gets from the, city, from, from the federal government and to kind of lay claim to more of the money that it's actually sending there? Now, Mayor Beam and Governor Hugh Carey, about whom we can talk more later, do not find a friendly audience in President Ford or his core advisors. The core advisors are pictured here, um, or some of them. The person being interviewed with the microphone is Secretary um, of the Treasury Department, um, William Simon. Simon is a, um, he actually comes out of the world of municipal bonds. He worked at Salomon Brothers at the municipal desks for many years. But he was fiercely opposed from a very early point to giving any aid to the city. He, um, Simon actually, after he leaves office, becomes, uh, he, he, he writes a book called A Time for Truth, which is kind of a Jeremiah to the business community, encouraging business people to become more active in political life. And he writes there about New York as kind of the failure of liberalism and microcosm. So he takes a very strongly ideological stance towards the city from an early point. Um, also pictured here is Alan Greenspan, kind of lounging on the floor wearing glasses. Um, Greenspan, too, was very opposed to providing aid to New York. Greenspan argued that uh, if the city went bankrupt, it would not have really a significant effect on the national markets or the economy, that, that the, the threat of bankruptcy had been discounted already, that there wasn't too much to worry about, and New York was just kind of crying out for aid to keep supporting programs that he thought were not relevant or valuable in their own right. In between them is actually Henry Kissinger, um, who doesn't actually play that much of a role in this story directly, but it is useful to remember that he is you know, hovering around in the background. Um, Donald Rumsfeld, Ford's chief of staff, was also not enthused by the idea of aiding the city. Uh, going along with New York, he wrote in an early memo, would be a disaster. First for New York, since they would delay cleaning up their mess. Second for the precedent it would set. In my view, the request is outrageous. 